Hi, I'm Dana Smith, Extension Field Crops Pathologist for the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Today we're going to talk a little about integrated approaches to white mold management and specifically some research to back up uh, some uh, recommendations that we have put together over the last couple of seasons. First, however, I want to just start and talk a little about the white mold uh, cycle on soybean. So we'll start at this point of the cycle here, which is after at the end of the season and the beginning of the uh, the next season where we have these uh, sclerotia, which are a hardened survival structure. These sclerotia are actually fungal material. They're formed on last season's plants, as you can see here. Once the plant is killed, you see the formation of even hundreds of these sclerotia on a single plant. When a combine goes through the field, they harvest these soybeans and knock the sclerotia off onto the surface of the soil, where they end up being lightly incorporated in the upper layer. Now this fungus is pretty unique in that it's timed its life cycle uh, in a lot of cases with the life cycle of soybean. So when the conditions are right during the season and during the bloom period in soybean, the formation of these mushrooms actually uh, develops on the uh, sclerotia or from the sclerotium. These little mushrooms are termed apothecia. They're a little cup-shaped mushroom and on these cup-shaped mushrooms form microscopic spores which you can see here. This is all timed very closely with the development of flowers on soybean. So the infection cycle, or the, the time uh, for infection in soybean really occurs uh, pretty, pretty finitely during the bloom period here. You can see these spores land on the flowers, they infect through these flowers, and then later in the season we get the, the disease development, which uh, usually are bleach lesions and, and death of plants. So really the opportunity in season to actually control this disease occurs during this bloom period, which is very important. Now in terms of yield reductions, we've uh, previously known that there uh, was traditionally a, what was termed a linear response in terms of increasing disease development and decreasing yield. However, more recently we've learned with the modern soybean uh, varieties, which have a bushy phenotype, uh, the, the uh, yield loss really isn't linear. Okay, this means that uh, as disease severity index or this DIX value increases, we actually have a point at which the, the curve or relative yield loss is, is actually fairly static or fairly level, okay, right here in this point in the curve. However, as disease gets more intense, we see that quickly we get into a pretty steep part of this curve here. So what governs this, this flat part versus the steep part? Well, it really has a lot to do with the morphology of the modern soybean. We have these bush phenotypes now with soybean, and uh, we've set a lot of yield on these lateral branches. And if we account in our disease index uh, uh, scoring here for these lateral branch hits, which we have here in this green box, we can see that uh, most of the yield reduction or slight yield reduction that we get in this point in the curve is actually from these uh, lateral branch hits. When we move into the steeper part of the curve, this is where we actually have a large number of, of uh, main stem hits. Obviously, these are much more important in terms of yield reduction, hence the steep part of this curve. Keep this in mind because this, this threshold right here where we start to break over into the steep part of the curve is right around 40% or 0.4 on this particular scale. And we'll use this score later on in this presentation. Now some questions that we've uh, uh, sort of heard farmers talk about over the last couple of seasons are, are listed here and we'll go through these uh, each in some detail. The first of which, is there genetic resistance to white mold? The second is what fungicides work for managing white mold? The third is when should I spray for white mold? And the fourth, what cultural practices should I use in my integrated management strategy? Before I begin with each of these questions, I just want to sort of jump to the punchline and, and tell you that no one management practice really is going to be complete. You're going to have to integrate multiple facets of management into your integrated management program. This might include capturing variety resistance or, or limited amounts of variety resistance, which we currently have in the commercial uh, uh, variety uh, selection. Canopy row width and planting population, maybe widening out the rows and reducing the planting populations, crop rotation, and then maybe chemical and or biological control. Uh, however, note that even chemical or biological control uh, can be incomplete and timing of application is extremely important and we'll talk more about this here in a, in a few slides. 
So I'll address the first question, which is whether we have varietal resistance in our uh, commercial soybean varieties. First, we'll look at some data, and these are data from the 2017 glyphosate intolerant soybean uh, trials, which are conducted by Dr. Sean Conley here at the University of Wisconsin. We're looking at data from uh, the Arlington Ag Research Station and also the Hancock Ag Research Station. And what we've done is pulled out some varieties which were planted at both of those locations. We've sorted these varieties by high to low yield at Arlington, and you can see for the most part these line up as well at Hancock with just a couple of slight deviations. More importantly, however, we've looked at the rated these for disease incidence or white mold disease incidence. And you'll notice that most of these performed fairly well, giving us just slight uh, uh, white mold incidence uh, at the Arlington location. However, notice at Hancock, we had much higher uh, white mold in this particular trial. And you can see that some of these varieties now uh, do not seem to respond uh, very well. Specifically, if we look at the S21-W8X, you'll see that at, at Arlington it gives a fairly low disease incidence score, but at Hancock gives a very high disease incidence score. The goal in studying these variety trials is to look for a consistently performing variety. For instance, this LS uh, brand variety here uh, has done fairly well at both Arlington and Hancock. So you'll want to study these across locations and try to choose something with the best resistance in multiple locations. Now the other thing we've tried to do is, is choose for physiological resistance in our soybean varieties. And the way we do this is actually uh, using petiole inoculations. So we cut out the fungus in these petri dishes. We use these little pipette tips, which are commonly found in any lab. And that forms a little incubation chamber. And we can actually uh, inoculate the plants at a node, a lower node on the plant. Sort of like what happens actually in the field. Our goal with this type of inoculation is actually to try to choose uh, or select for a high, uh, high level of physiological resistance. And we want to do that mainly on the main stem. And you can see in our, uh, in our slide here, here's an example of a lesion that can develop from one of these inoculations. We can then go in and measure this with a digital set of calipers, and we can start to select for things which produce the smallest lesions. Here's an example of one of these uh, trials from February of 2018 in a greenhouse uh, setting where we've taken some of the commercial variety, uh, commercial varieties which performed well in the field, and we're actually assaying them for physiological resistance. You can see we have a high, uh, high level of kill in this particular trial. This means that while some of these lines look fairly good in the field, they actually don't give us a high level of actual physiological resistance, meaning they don't actually fight the infection uh, from the white mold fungus. However, you can see some of these lines in here actually uh, doing fairly well, still surviving this form of inoculation. These perhaps have a high level of physiological resistance. We really believe that this two-pronged approach of, uh, of inoculation in the greenhouse and selection in the field can help us determine which varieties are most resistant. The other thing that happens uh, with uh, white mold and, and sclerotinia and, and on soybean is that you can have multiple forms of the fungal population. And not one, uh, one soybean may not uh, respond the same across these different populations. And here's an example of what I'm talking about here. So along this lower axis, this horizontal axis here, we have isolate, okay? Nine different isolates. You can think about these as nine different field populations. We then have three different types of soybean uh, varieties here. This is a resistant germplasm line in our breeding program. This is a moderately resistant uh, germplasm line. And then this is a susceptible uh, uh, public cultivar. And you can see the susceptible overall responds with higher uh, relative disease scores here uh, if you compare that against the moderately resistant and the resistant. However, you'll note, even in the resistant variety here, we do occasionally run into a population which can actually overcome that resistance in the, re in the resistant uh, soybean line. And for instance here, this isolate number 20, overcoming the high level of, of resistance in 91145. So our goal here is to actually screen varieties across multiple isolates as well, or multiple populations, so that we're sure we have a line which is also consistent across locations. 
Here's a subset of, of uh, germplasm lines and also a couple of cultivars which we've uh, attempted to perform this multi-pronged approach of, of selection and trying to understand uh, resistance. Here we have uh, some uh, very resistant uh, uh, varieties in our, in our uh, breeding program here which are fairly consistent even in the field. These are our greenhouse data here. Along this axis is a relative disease score uh, an area under the disease progress curve. So the higher the bar, the more susceptible a particular line is. You'll see susceptible checks here, including this ASGRO 2031, a commercial variety. And then we have a public variety here, Dwight, giving us a fairly uh, consistent susceptible reaction. An array of lines in the middle here, giving us a moderately resistant reaction. And again, our, our resistant uh, scoring uh, uh, lines down here. Now we can run this same set of lines in a, in a field performance evaluation. So these are uh, the exact same uh, varieties you just saw in the previous slide, but now we see some shifting in, in lines. So here we have our susceptible checks. You see now ASGRO 2031 is shifted down. Again, we're shooting for uh, consistency across the greenhouse trials and the field uh, performance evaluations. You can see 9144 moved itself up. Dwight uh, is consistently susceptible. However, you'll notice some of these lines still looking fairly uh, resistant for us, including this particular line here, this 9138. We're actually going to release this as a commercial food grade variety. Uh, its name will be Dane, hopefully available in the 2019 uh, growing season. Now, what is the real value of this high level of physiological resistance, and why have I spent mo so much time talking about this? Well, this is an example of where the rubber meets the road right here. So here's our resistant soybean line 5282B. We have a susceptible cultivar here, Dwight. And we planted these in 2017 in a high white mold environment, and we even uh, planted them in two different populations at 160,000 seeds per acre and 120,000 seeds per acre. And we sprayed with Endura uh, at R2, or we didn't treat. You can see right off the bat that 5282B is extremely resistant here. This is the white mold index score along this axis here, and we've put a, a reference line here in red. You can see that Dwight, being the susceptible cultivar, is responding quite well to the Endura fungicide application with a significant reduction in, in either of the um, uh, planting populations here where we have uh, the Endura fungicide. Our resistant soybean line, however, not responding hardly at all to fungicide application, indicating its high level of resistance. So if we look at yield uh, in the same trial, again, uh, our resistant soybean line here in the top graph, our susceptible cultivar on the bottom graph, you can see even in the high population here, a pretty good response, again, uh, with our susceptible cultivar where we sprayed uh, Endura. Notice in the upper graph here, if we focus on 160,000 seeds per acre as an example, again, very little response where we used fungicide here. So what's this really worth? Well, an Endura, a single application of Endura at the uh, eight ounce uh, per acre rate would list at about $40 per acre. If you don't own your own sprayer, uh, the average application fee is about $7 per acre. And then if we compare the non-sprayed 160,000 uh, seeds per acre yield for our resistant line and compare that to the sprayed uh, Dwight uh, yield here, our resistant soybean line actually out yielded the sprayed Dwight uh, uh, cultivar here by four bushels per acre. So if we do some quick math on the back of an envelope, that gives us a total value of about $87 per acre if our soybean price is, is, at, is at $10 per bushel. So again, high value uh, for this type of resistance if we can get this into our commercial uh, varieties. But beware, we don't have this type of physiological resistance out there commercially available. Continue to choose things which respond well across locations, but bear in mind you're probably gonna have to do some other things out in the field. So that brings us to fungicide applications, uh, including product and application timing. And we've done quite a bit of work with our colleagues across the north central U.S. and performed actually what's called a network meta-analysis. This is just a fancy term for saying that we have a large number of, of data points here, actually over 2,000 data points in over 25 site years. The beauty in this kind of data is that we can, uh, we can look at a particular product and its response and, and its timing of application 
and see how consistent that is across location and we can also use this information to make predictions on how well these things will perform in the future. We actually looked at 10 common active ingredients here and seven, seven common timings. So in the next uh, few uh, graphs here, we'll be looking at a couple of different scores. The first is disease index reduction score, and this will be in percent. So this will be the d disease index of the treated minus the disease index of the non-treated in that, in that particular trial. And then we'll look at yield benefit in percent here, I, again, against the non-treated in that, in that particular trial. The reason why we're using percents, especially for yield benefit, is you can take this percent uh, score that we, we have here and affix your yield potential on your farm. You'll see the 10 active ingredients over here uh, on the right hand side and then also the common fungicide timings uh, relative to the growth stage of soybeans here, starting at late vegetative all the way into late reproductive. So let's just take a look at some data here. These are the mean disease index reductions uh, across the 10 active ingredients here. We'll focus on a couple of uh, products up here in this blue box. However, I just wanna point out what these actually are. So this first one here, this lact, is actually uh, the uh, uh, herbicide Cobra. Bosque is the uh, fungicide Endura. Pico is the fungicide Approach. And then another commonly uh, our well-performing uh, program, at least for us here in Wisconsin, historically has been this one here, the ProLine followed by Stratego Yield Program. Again, we'll focus up here. You can see that Cobra giving us uh, the best reductions, almost 20% reductions here, but not statistically different from Endura or Approach in this particular analysis. Now, if we look at the yield benefits for these three uh, programs that we'll focus on here, you'll see now that uh, the, the herbicide Cobra actually falls down a little bit uh, below 10% yield benefit and statistically lower than Endura or Approach. So what's going on here? Well, the application of Cobra at the recommended uh, timing of the R1 growth stage in soybean does cause some phytotoxicity and injury. And that's probably, if we just take the mean uh, yield benefits here, that's probably what's giving us this lower score. Okay, so the, the story gets a little clearer if we actually separate the yield benefit scores uh, by low and high disease pressure situations. How do we arrive at a low disease or a high disease pressure situation? Well, early on when we looked at the yield uh, loss analysis, I showed you that there was a 40% cutoff from where we go from subtle yield loss to really high yield loss. And we use that same cutoff here in this particular analysis. Now, if we separate low and high disease pressure, now we see that, uh, that uh, the COBRA situation sorts itself out a bit. Where we look at the high disease here in the red bars, we can see that there's no statistically significant differences here in terms of yield benefits, uh, again, among Endura, Approach, and COBRA. However, in the low disease situation, again, that injury that we get from uh, COBRA applied at the R1 growth stage does seem to give us a mean uh, negative yield benefit here in this case. Note, however, that uh, Endura and Approach still give us a positive yield benefit in this particular graph. Now, in terms of fungicide application timing, you can see that the maximal responses are typically centered right around the, the bloom period. Again, this makes sense because this fungus is infecting the plants during that bloom period and having a fungicide applied during that time helps protect those flowers from, from invasion by the fungus. You can see that the two spray programs, an R1 followed by an R2 application or an R1 followed by an R3, uh, typically give us uh, the best responses. However, we don't have statistically significant differences uh, uh, against some of these other single applications here. Now when we look at the yield benefits here, again the same sort of story where we have basically the maximal yield benefits centered uh, right around that bloom period with some of these single applications giving us almost as good yield uh, benefit as the two spray programs here, specifically here with R1 or R2 applications. Now we can take all these means and the variability about the means and we can actually start to fix some probabilities of breaking even. So we'll take the low pressure situation and the high pressure situation here, and we'll focus here at $10 uh, per bushel soybeans. If we use that, th this math here, we can estimate that the, the probability of breaking even, at least in a low disease pressure situation in this case, for Endura here in the blue bar or Approach in the purple bar are somewhere around 40%, with Cobra being almost 60%. 
The reason why Cobra is so much uh, more attractive in terms of the probability of breaking even is because it's, it's quite a bit cheaper than the two fungicide programs. Now if you look at the high pressure situation here, things change quite dramatically. Now we get uh, over 80% for all three programs. However, Cobra is still, still being the best at over 90% even in this case. But note here, Endura and, and uh, Approach still performing well uh, above 80%. Now that we understand which products to apply and what timings are really important, how do we really make that decision in season when we can't see the fungus and we don't understand what's going on uh, relative to the bloom period? And is, it, is the weather really going to be favorable for, for these infections to take place? We've been working on this in, in my lab and trying to actually predict the formation of these little cup-shaped mushrooms. Again, we call these apothecia. And here you can see that little hardened uh, structure which forms on, on the previous soybean crop here, that little sclerotium. And one sclerotium can actually form multiple uh, mushrooms, cup-shaped mushrooms here. What we have tried to do in my lab is actually understand the weather information that drives the formation of these cup mushrooms. If we align that weather information during the bloom period, we can actually make predictions on whether we need a fungicide application based on the probability of presence of these uh, mushrooms. We can then uh, fix that weather modeling, if you will, on a gridded weather input scale, and that's what we've done here in these maps. So this weather information was made available through the iPipe program, and we've run these animated maps for 2016 and 2017. And you can see 2017 being a, a much better epidemic year for the, for the white mold fungus. We see a lot more red and yellow indicating high to moderate risk uh, through the bloom period. 2016, not quite as, uh, quite as high a risk, but still quite a bit of white mold in that particular season. We can also make recommendations in season during that bloom period and, and, and tell growers whether, they should be, whether there's a high risk of these apothecia forming in the field or not. And that gives us an informed recommendation on whether we should spray or not. So the goal here is to actually be able to predict the end of season disease relative to what's going on during that bloom period. And we've done some validations, uh, both in research trials and also commercial fields, with, over, with around 60 commercial fields being scouted in 2016 and in 2017. Depending on what disease incidence threshold we use in these field situations, whether it be 5% or 10%, again, these would be well below the, the yield uh, loss uh, or where we would start to see yield loss in a particular field. We can see that we're, we're correct uh, about 75 to 80% of the time. Okay, so that's better than, than a coin flip or, or 50%. So we believe we have a model here that can help us predict the end of season disease by actually running this uh, earlier in the season during the bloom period. To see how this might actually work in a real field situation, here's an example of a strip trial that was conducted up in Marathon County, Wisconsin in 2017. Here we're using the fungicide approach. We have the uh, standard two-pass program where we come in at nine ounces per acre at R1. We come back at R3 and apply a second application at nine ounces per acre. This will be the control treatment out here. And my uh, lab rated this uh, on average at about 12 to 33% uh, across this, this particular uh, trial with about 56 bushels per acre yield. You can see the same uh, treatment out here on this side of the field. We then had strips where we didn't apply fungicide, where we had 66% disease incidence and we averaged about 41 bushels per acre across the strip. We had a single application at R1 here of approach, not doing uh, quite as well as our two-pass program here, but giving us some reduction relative to the non-treated and yielding about 47 and a half bushels. Notice here we had a R3 application, so again a single application at that R3 soybean growth stage. Here we had 26% disease incidence and about 55 and a half bushels per acre uh, yield. And then we had a three pass program, R1, R3, and R5, about 27% disease incidence and 58 uh, bushels per acre. Notice the, the addition of this third pass really didn't give us much advantage in terms of yield, however, or any advantage really in the reduction in disease incidence. Now, why did this R3 application, this single application R3 work so well? 
Well, if we look at the estimated probabilities in our uh, disease or our uh, apothecial prediction model here, you can see that at the R1 growth stage, we were at uh, we just started to, uh, we were in the high uh, probability of apothecial presence category here. But notice that the real pro the probabilities really started to ramp up when we got to the R3 growth stage here. This application R3 uh, performed very well because that weather was so much more conducive for the fungus at that particular time. And so we're not only able to make a prediction uh, uh, what we might see at the end of the season, but we can help actually time the application of these fungicides more closely with when the weather is going to be highly favorable for the development of this disease. We've taken these models and we put them into a smartphone application. And here's an example of what the smartphone application will actually look like. On the first screen, you'll enter the field name. You'll also tell us whether uh, which what, what row spacing you have, either 15 or 30 inch, and whether the crop is irrigated or not. If you're physically standing in the field, it'll actually use the GPS on your smartphone to access uh, the exact location. You'll hit save. That'll actually get saved into your field profile for access for the remainder of the season. The next screen, you'll answer another piece of information on whether the crop is flowering at that time while you're standing in the field. And then you'll run the model. The, mod or the application will actually access remote weather information, pull that down to the smartphone, and it'll run all the math for you based on our models and give you a prediction on whether you should spray or not spray on that particular day. You can rerun these models as many times during the day as you like or as many times during the week as you like. We are actually running are developing these apps right now and they should be available during the, uh, in time for the growing season. And we'd like to get information from you on how well these perform as this will be the first time that we'll actually be running these in season. Just to finish up with uh, another couple pieces of information, we get a lot of questions on what things should we be doing in terms of row spacing and also uh, planting population in our integrated management uh, strategy for uh, white mold control. We've started to look at some of this, uh, actually revisiting both row spacing and planting population simultaneously and then layering on uh, fungicide applications on top of that. So this is just uh, some information on how our trials are set up. I'll show you just one location, but we are using 15 and 30 inch row spacings. And we have planting populations ranging from 110,000 seeds to 200,000 seeds per acre. We're applying fungicide based on the uh, prediction models. Uh, and we're comparing that uh, uh, versus our non-treated or, uh, or a standard growth stage uh, application timing. Here's just one location from uh, Hancock where we've run uh, this trial in 2017. Along the vertical axis here, we have the disease severity index in percent. In the top graph, we have the 30 inch row spacing and on the bottom graph, we have the 15 inch row spacing. I've affixed a reference line here at around 20% uh, in both graphs. And you can see in the 30-inch uh, row spacing, we have almost 50% less uh, 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 white mold uh, than we do in the 15-inch uh, row spacing here. Now, as you know, farmers would rather plant in a 15-inch row spacing because they gain on average about five bushels per acre in that narrow row spacing. However, notice we have much higher uh, uh, white mold uh, in this particular trial in that narrow row spacing. Now, if we look at yield, you can see that the relative yield scores between either the 30 inch row spacing or the 15 inch row spacing are actually very similar. Very little advantage actually in the 15 inch row spacing. Again, that's because we had 50% more white mold actually in the 15 inch row spacing. So that took that five bushels uh, away from us that we would have gained in that narrow row spacing. So the moral of the story here is in a high white mold situation, you might want to lean more towards a 30 inch row spacing to help reduce the level of white mold. In terms of planting population, we did see a little bit of advantage here in the higher planting populations with slightly higher yield scores here. They were marginally significant, uh, especially in the 30 inch row spacing, uh, but not very comparable or, or not very uh, significant here in the 15 inch row spacings. Fungicide, unfortunately, in this particular trial didn't give us much advantage. However, the variety used here was quite susceptible, which means our, our fungicide just couldn't overcome that, that susceptibility. So just to sum all of this up, really, you know, in your integrated management program is going to be multi-pronged here. You're going to have to look at a, a, a number of different things to really get uh, suitable control in these high white mold environments. 
Remember to look for uh, uh, resistant varieties, study multiple locations, and look for varieties which are consistent across uh, multiple locations. Remember that fungicide uh, isn't perfect. In some cases, we're going to have to reduce our uh, expectation on the performance of these products. Remember in the strip trial, even our best performing products still had some white mold uh, in those strips. Timing is very important when it comes to those, uh, when it comes to those fungicide applications. So either plan on spraying two applications to cover yourself during that bloom period, or consider using our white mold apps uh, to make that prediction on whether you should spray or not. Finally, remember that wider row spacings can help reduce your white mold uh, uh, issues, and also lower planting populations may also give you uh, marginally lower uh, white mold scores as well. And again, don't forget those resistant varieties. With that, I'd like to just acknowledge uh, all the funders and collaborators which have helped us with all of this work. And uh, for more information, you can uh, consult me on Twitter or access my website here, or feel free to reach out either via phone or email.